Hey, can I have your attention? Let's get started. We've got a quorum, and we've got really a full schedule, and we're already behind, and these rooms have to be totally desanitized. So the schedule is was already messed up before we ever started, and now it's really messed up. So the, to the committee members, thank you for your very quick response. Uh, I know y'all drove here or came here not thinking we were meeting today, but uh, had some discussions with leadership, and they wanted us to meet today. Um, Mr. Bonner, would you open us in prayer, please? <clears throat> You for giving us this time together we just pray that you would uh, guide our thoughts guide our hearts and allow us to make good decisions for the people of georgia in your name we pray amen all right yeah uh thank you molly has reminded me that there's a sign up sheet there's only one sign up sheet so when you sign up uh, let me know which bill you want to speak for or against and then if you want to speak for or against it the very first bill is going to be Senate Bill 408, and we are honored to have Senator Strickland, who I have great respect for. He actually is my predecessor in this very seat. So, uh, but if we well respected him way before then, so, and he's got his better half with him, um, Lindsay, who also works here at the Capitol. So, Brian, the uh, floor is yours. <laughs> Probably. Is <laughs> that Tom? <laughs> Thank you all members of the committee. Um, I bring to you Senate Bill 408. And when you look at the bill, you're going to say, I'm not sure what this bill does. And so I brought with me a copy of the code section that we're actually addressing so I can answer any questions about what the actual law says. A little bit of history on this. In 2017, um, I carried... Senate Bill 201 in the House, and Senate Bill 201 is had a sunset on it, where the bill is going to, uh, the law is going to sunset as of July 1st of this year. And so I brought Senate Bill 408 to eliminate that sunset. If you remember back with 201, the actual underlying law, um, what we're doing with this bill is we're saying that if you are an employee that has earned sick leave you can use up to five of those sick leave days as long as you otherwise are complying with sick leave policies up to five of those states to care for other immediate family members that are also sick um, the idea of the bill was and it's, it's just now more relevant than ever um, a lot of times while um, a lot of folks of course are taking care of kids at home taking care of elderly parents or grandparents and um, you may not be sick but when they get sick your world stops especially when you're having them at home all the time anyway right now and um, when I had the bill originally back in 2017 someone called the, the bill that you don't have to lie to your employer anymore bill um, because people said well you're just going to say you're sick and so uh, we had a good debate at the time about whether or not this was good policy i think most of us agreed this was a fair thing and but in fairness those that oppose the bill said we shouldn't under georgia law be mandating something like this and so in all that um, we did put this sunset so we could see how this would affect employers in our state and I can tell you, uh, and so far we're carrying the bill to the Senate back before COVID hit, we've heard from no one had any concern about ne any negative impact from this bill. Instead, we actually heard from folks and this, this helped in our state. We're the number one state in which to do business, but this also helped ensure we're the number one state to work in a business as well. And so a couple of things I'll go back over with the underlying law. Again, you have to be, you can only use up to five of your sick leave days to care for other immediate family members. Immediate family members are defined by um, those that you claim as a dependent on your taxes. Otherwise, it's a child, a spouse, a grandchild, grandparent, or a parent um, that's in your home as well. And um, I mentioned that you otherwise have to comply with the sick leave policy that's set up by an employer. And the bill also confirms that no employer is required to offer sick leave. You can still offer other types of leave, pay time off for someone, but if you offer sick leave, this law would apply. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll be happy to answer any questions anybody has about this bill. I'm going to start with me. I've got two. Uh, just to clarify, so if, if you don't like this bill, there's really two ways to get around it. One, 
if you don't have a policy regarding sick leave, you're not even affected by this, correct? That's correct. Okay. Number two, if you simply had, instead of having sick leave, if you just said, because what I did for 35 years, I just gave my employees 10 leave days because I didn't care if they were sick or if they were six flags. If they're not there, they're not there. Mm -hmm. So you're right. Instead of calling it, calling saying I'm sick, if, if your policy states these are just leave days, you're really not affected by this at all, correct? That's correct. Okay. Well, thank you for the clarification. Uh, Mr. Kirby. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, now, if this bill sunsets July 1st as it's originally passed and should, there is nothing to prevent an employer from doing this if it fits their business model, is there? That's correct. There's so, nothing to protect an employee. So either, this though. is just where we're telling businesses how to run a policy. How many times have you sat down with businesses and determined how many days we're going, they're going to pay people not to work or what their leave policies are going to be? Oh, I haven't. The bill doesn't do that either. That's not what we're doing with this no, bill. No, I no, know, I know the bill doesn't do that, but, I mean, if it's part of the process when we sit down in a business, we determine how many days from vacation and holidays that we pay people not to work, what other leaves and things we're going to make available, and there's a real reason for a sick leave for employee only to prevent presenteeism. And COVID-19 is a great example. We've been doing this. When somebody is actually sick, we want them to use those days so they don't infect others. Not to take care of family or go to Six Flags or anything else. We have other things available for those. And again, this is still overreaching into government telling businesses, here's what your policy is and how you're going to do it, isn't it? No, and, and look, we had this debate back in 2017, um, and I, th I think you were wrong then, but in order to get support for the bill, we put the sunset on it so we could see if you were right, and I, st I still think you're wrong because we have not heard from any um, private employee employers in the state, including the Chamber of Commerce, anybody who said this bill has been a problem. Look, to me, and, I, and by the way, I respect your position on this, um, but I think there are certain things that we ought to say are bare minimums, right? I think there, are certain, uh, there is a certain role for government in this sector. There are certain things we should say, here is the bar in Georgia. And that's what we're doing with this bill. As the chairman pointed out, a business could go a different direction with their own um, paid time off policy. But if you're going to box an employee in and say, this is our sick leave, this is the only thing you can use your leave for, I think it's fair for the state to say there are some minimums here. We're going to make sure that people that are single moms, um, that are caring for grandparents, caring for parents, these people have some flexibility, some minimum standard in Georgia law to care for the people in their homes. So, so in reality, you're, you're rewriting attendance policies and how many days somebody can miss work before they have a problem or rewriting shift schedules. I mean, I, you, <laughs> again, well, I, I know you, we're not going to agree. I no, understand but that. <laughs> the, in fairness, the bill doesn't do that. You're saying things the bill doesn't do. And so I will defend the bill and those that have supported it and say what you're saying is not correct. You're using extreme examples to why you oppose this particular bill. This bill doesn't do that. Okay, let's go on to some other people. Uh, number seven, is that Sam, Representative Park? Thank you, Chairman. Um, thank you, Senator Strickland, for the bill. Um, j just to clarify, is it not true that the only thing that Senate Bill 48 would do would be to remove the sunset provision in your bill where everything else is essentially left the same? That's correct. Is it not further true that the code section um, 34.110 simply requires employers to provide employees the flexibility to provide for immediate family members, it doesn't require them to give them sick paid leave or extend any additional benefits? Is that not true? That's correct. Um, so thank you, uh, Senator Strickland. Um, Mr. Chairman, at the appropriate time, I would make a motion to do pass. Okay, we've got Representative Bonner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and thanks, Senator Strickland, for bringing the bill. My question is on this issue of the sunset. So if, since the, since the bill's been in place, it, do you have a concern that if we allow it to expire, that industry would somehow revert back to what they've already adjusted to over the course of the last three years or so? Um, I haven't heard from the industries that said they would do that. They wouldn't admit that. Um, and so I guess I could say in theory, yes, I think it's a fair law to have on the books. 
though in fairness, I've not heard of any companies that want to go a different direction right now privately. And so maybe it's a yes or a no, but I think it's important to still have this on the books just in case there are some extreme examples of companies that may want to change the policies now. So do you think it would be fair to say that there are, that there are industries that would continue to um, adhere to this policy whether or not the government mandated oh, it? Oh, sure. Okay. Sure, that's fair. And so, and so given that, it, it seems to me that um, and, and, I, and I think in all fairness, you know, when, when we consider legislation, we put sunsets in there for a reason, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of times what we are told is that we want to have put the sunset, even what you said earlier, to see whether or not the law, the law worked. Sure. And, and I think in this case, we could, you know, I, I think probably agree it, to, that it worked in a sense that there's been, there was no huge outcry necessarily from industry. But it seems as though, I guess in my, my thought is, why continue it when it seems as though industry has probably most likely made that adjustment, and especially in the environment where we are, we are where we were in and, and are moving to now with the, the economy getting better, moving from a great economy, hitting this uh, snag with the, with the pandemic, but as the economy continues to, to grow and strengthen, that it you know, companies are having to uh, compete for employees. And so rather than us as the government mandating what they do, why not allow our corporations and industries to compete and attract employees in a, in, in a way that they deem best? And, and I would submit that, you know, under this previous mandate, they probably saw some value in it. And I would, and I would submit that moving forward, they're going to evaluate their employee policies in a way that's going to attract, you know, recruit and retain employees rather than push them away, given the fact that the economy is picking up so much. So um, th that's my, you know, hesitation mm -hmm. with this is that we, you know, we put sunsets in for a reason. Uh, it seems as though the industry has adapted and they'll continue to do so. And the, the fewer government mandates on that, in, in my opinion, the better. So. Okay. But thank you. And the only response I'll say um, is I think the reverse of that could be true. Why not leave it in the law? Why not have this minimum standard? Um, as Representative Park pointed out, you have some safeguards in there to keep this from, from being something that's overly burdensome on an employer, too. Um, but I, I, I do respect your position that businesses should make these decisions. The question is, do we want to have that minimum standard under Georgia law? And I think we send a message um, across the country if we don't extend this sunset then and we're basically we're, we're in essence repealing the law we are going backwards and we're saying to people that want to go and work somewhere want to start a business somewhere that georgia's not going to have these certain standards so um, i think given today's environment especially that'd be a risky thing to do too representative carter is that you yes okay go ahead you can see me behind the mask huh <laughs> No, I couldn't. I couldn't tell what the numbers are. <laughs> oh, yes. Okay. So, anyway, thank you. Um, so, I, I wasn't coming to the meeting because I'm one of those that I'm trying to stay as safe as possible. Um, but I saw a couple of bills. I was like, let me get over here. And I'm especially glad that I'm here for this. Now, I understand and agree with everything everyone has said. But I want to bring back the point that you made, whereas um, the employer sets the policy. However, this language allows the employee to tell the truth. And one of the things I think that we're missing is if we allow this law to sunset and if an uh, employee has to care for someone in their family and their only option is to say that they are sick. And if that employer requires them to bring a note from the doctor after being out a certain amount of days, that employee can't bring a doctor's note. Therefore, having this flexibility allows the employee to tell the truth. They also are not putting their job in jeopardy because they lied. So I think this may be one time 
where we need to show some consistency uh, in policy that uh, supports workers in Georgia. So, okay. if <clears throat> Sam does, if, if Representative Park doesn't make the motion, I'd like to it appropriate. Okay, thank time. you. Uh, Representative Jones, you had your light on, you pass, you wave? Okay. Uh, Rep well, okay, before we do the motion, uh, who? Carpenter. Carpenter, go ahead. I apologize for being late. I'm just reading through this, and I'm not the smartest guy. Wait, we're not on. Which one you on? The, we're on uh, 408, just the sunset. Sorry. I uh, wasn't going to insult you. I thought, surely you could read this one. <laughs> we got to laugh sometimes around here, don't we? Yeah. Sorry. There's some confusion here. There was a change on the other bill we're about to hear. And on the title, it says substitute to Senate Bill 408. Scrap that. Sorry. That the other bill. Oh, hold on a second. <laughs> you might have been right. Isn't because that's the CARES Act. Isn't that the other? Hold on a second. All right. Disregard the very top line on the left where it says substitute to Senate Bill 408 for right now. That is the bill we're about to hear. Apologies. Because there was a change in the other bill and everything has happened very quickly and fluid recently. Okay? Does that make sense? Like the bill, like LC 364406S is the next bill we're about to hear. So go back to, because technically the only bill, Senator Strickland's bill, the only line is to remove the sunset, but he brought the copy and we have discussed the previous, what the previous bill does. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. Can I make one comment just, yeah. if, if you're gonna, if we are combining those bills? And we are, I didn't know when the appropriate time, okay, um, there was, when I passed the bill in the Senate, there was a change we made on the effective date to make sure that Senate Bill 408, because of that July 1st date, was effective upon um, approval of the governor or becoming uh, approved otherwise by law. I just want to make sure that with the substitute, we still have that line that it's effective upon approval by the governor since we have this deadline with this bill. Okay. And for some clarification, and I, number one, I turned everybody's lights on, so if you want to speak, turn it back on. Um, the, the next bill we're about to hear, because of the pandemic, it's needed, but because we're past crossover, we needed a vehicle, so we were attaching both these bills are going to be Senate Bill 408. So, so actually, when I said strike substitute 408, it's not a sub. It, it is going to get to test to 408, but I was going to. I'm trying to discuss both these bills independently and separately. Does that make sense? They're all going to be Senate Bill 408, but we are discussing Senate Bill 408 version 1.0 right now. Okay. <laughs> for this session. Sorry about that, folks. Okay. Yeah. So, Representative Carter, did you have? Okay. Yeah. Because. Because. We got to be honest too. So you presented a bill as if it was a separate standalone bill. Now you're telling us it's a part of another bill. Well, it so, will be. So, 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 mm -mm -mm -mm. so integrity is relevant and words are relevant. So if we're about to substitute a bill, we should be talking about the bill in totality because I may not agree on the other parts of and the you're bill. You're going to get that chance when we bring that bill up. Right. But I'm just saying from a matter of integrity, the substitute is what should have been presented to us, not have us discuss a bill as if they were two different bills that we were going to vote on. They are two want, different bills. I just want that to be made clear. And it has been presented to you. Okay. Sam, 
Representative Parks. Uh, thank you, Chairman Workheiser. Uh, so focusing on, um, again, the initial proposal to, rem to remove the sunset provision, I had just two quick questions to follow up. Is it not true that the additional requirement uh, to allow uh, sick leave to be used for immediate family members, is it not true that there's been no uh, additional financial impact on companies to provide that flexibility? Right, that's true. We passed it in 2017. Of course, I filed this bill earlier back when we were in session. I've heard from not a soul that had any issue with compliance or spent money trying to comply, and I, didn't, I haven't heard of any opposition to the bill except on the Senate floor. I believe there were six senators that voted against. Other than that, no opposition ever heard. Thank you, Senator. Uh, one final question, if I may. What message do you think this body would be sending if we limited sick paid leave in the midst of a pandemic? Hmm. I think it's the wrong message, and I think as was pointed out to me, this body is also for your own employees enacted a similar policy. And I believe the state of Georgia is in the same thing for state employees. So you'd also be saying there's two separate standards as well. Thank you, Senator. Okay, and for clarification. For clarification, there is one bill. If you look at LC 364406S, the very top line, which is what we're discussing, is Senator Strickland's bill. And then after that, we're going to discuss and bring up the Department of Labor. So it is one big bill. Nobody's trying to slide anything out. So now, I think we've exhausted the questions for Senator Strickland. And since we, it is one big bill, we're not saying we're going to wait on your motion, if that's all right. And I'm going to call up uh, Christina Smith and her attorney and our very learned attorney, Sean Marie Story. I'm going to have, let you all come up. And i tell you what I did learn during this process, which further confirmed what we already knew because we were discussing with several people in the Capitol. We have the best attorney from Legislative Council and Sean Marie. <laughs> So while she's making her way up, uh, just to give you how this came about, uh, the pandemic changed a lot of things, uh, not only for families but for government. And there was some uh, ties with, fa and, we, and we do that a lot in this committee. We have to do things in our code so that it is consistent and congruent with federal code if we're going to receive monies. So with that. Um, Set your name and title for the record and go ahead and begin. Um, thank you, distinguished commissioner. My name is Jeffrey Babcock. I'm the manager of legal services for the unemployment insurance division at the Georgia Department of Labor. I'm here to present uh, this bill today. Um, commissioner Butler would love to be here today to answer all your questions, but unfortunately wasn't able to. Um, if you want to call him back another day to answer some questions, I'm sure he'd be willing to do that as well. Um, the, just to be brief and, and not use up too much of your time, the, the purpose of this bill is to address um, some, essentially, some provisions that will sunset once the um, here once the judicial or the excuse me the state of emergency, if it ends. There were some um, actions that were taken um, along with the um, assistance from the governor's office very early on when this pandemic began to provide additional assistance. Um, to both employers and employees in the state, um, to non-charge employers for um, unemployment benefits that were paid, to provide an extension of additional weeks of benefits, um, to increase the amount of money you could earn um, in a week before you would um, be disqualified from receiving benefits. And so those provisions were temporary and um, they will end. Um, and so the purpose of this bill is to um, get some more permanence to that. And there are basically three um, sections of this bill. The first section, um, 34830, addresses the deductible earnings amount. Um, that um, is the amount that you can earn um, before your benefit amount is offset. And um, what that does is it allows the commissioner to set that level, not to exceed $300 a week, um, and set that level by administrative rule. Um, currently, that is where it is. Um, on the, or the emergency measures that have been adopted um, during the pandemic. The second um, gives the commissioner um, emergency authority in a very limited set of circumstances um, to make seven specific temporary adjustments to the code. 
Um, this is limited to when there's a statewide emergency declared by the governor and the legislature is not in session as we found ourselves during this last pandemic. Um, it, these, uh, these specific adjustments, again, are the same types of things to um, non-charge employers to extend deadlines for filing reports um, um, and making payments of taxes, those types of things. And these will be posted on the DOL website, um, distributed to de designated executive and legislative staff. Um, and they terminate, similar to an emergency rule, uh, 120 days from adoption unless the commissioner specifies a date earlier or the date, wide, uh, the, date the statewide emergency ends. And then the third provision, um, uh, basically one of the actions that was taken was to extend the um, eligibility up to 26 weeks for um, regular unemployment insurance benefits. The current law provides for a sliding scale between 14 and 20 weeks. And um, we're proposing that that be um, extended from up to 14 to 26 weeks. And then that um, third um, section also has corresponding language about the deductible earnings level um, that matches the first section. Um, and so um, I'll turn the time back to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you and for being succinct in that. Uh, and, and I want to say this, because uh, there was a comment made on the floor about Department of Labor this morning. Uh, I know in my case, because I, like all of you, I, I had a lot of constituent uh, issues and I cannot say thank you enough to the Department of Labor for the timeliness and response and them fixing those issues uh, with uh, an apartment that has been overrun and I don't know what the exponential factor is with uh, cases so thank you um, for doing that and with that I count on who's first uh, Representative Carpenter I, I actually um, want to say the exact same thing. Uh, your department's done a heck of a job, uh, and they should be proud of the effort that they've done throughout this pandemic. It's You've seen a huge workload. Uh, the people that I'm dealing with in Whitfield County are positive. They're returning calls. They're getting after it, and uh, you should be proud of how your, how your team has responded to this. I do have a little bit of concern moving forward. And let, me, let me give you a scenario because that $300 piece is a big piece in the restaurant business all right so currently as we sit right now i have employees that are working 15 hours a week so they're making 150 dollars a week from me plus they're getting 100 from you plus they're getting 600 from the feds i mean let that sink in 850 dollars a week and they're working 15 hours before the pandemic they were working 15 hours Nothing's changed for them other than that two or three week period. But now that they're back at work at the same amount of time, they still qualify for unemployment under that three hundred because they're under that three hundred dollar level. So we need to realize that while it's it's important for people in higher income brackets that would only get that three eighty five or three sixty five from the state, that they be able to go work and make three hundred dollars more so they're up to six something we need to evaluate that system and say instead of that three hundred dollar base because there's exploitation at that base is let's bump the top end up and let's say look you can you can qualify up to seven hundred dollars a week to catch the people you're trying to help because what you're doing is you're creating a window of exploitation and it's happening throughout my industry i mean i've got 70 employees on unemployment right now they're all working mm -hmm. But guess what? They fall under that three hundred dollar range because they're you know minimum wage or ten dollars. I say minimum wage; they make ten dollars an hour. So that's my concern. And it's not as an employer if I tell them, "Sorry, I'm not filing your unemployment because I, I think you're still working." You're 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 penalizing your employees versus their peers. So you're you know you're making the business owner decide. You know, does he want to take care of his employees like everybody else getting paid, or you just want to stand there, stand firm and say, "Sorry, you're making the hundred fifty dollars." It's a, it's it, the Fed six hundred dollars is a lot of it, right? But that state piece is still the same, and I think we need to evaluate that. I would much rather you say, you know, in in an emergency situation, we're going to bump that three sixty five up to seven hundred and fifty, whatever, to to make the people that were making fifty thousand dollars a year whole. Versus create a window of exploitation for the for the ten dollar an hour employee. So that's that's my concern. Good point, Representative Kirby. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and and I also want to echo and, and make sure you share with Commissioner Butler. I mean, uh, uh, he and I have talked a lot, and and I think everybody knows I've 
I'll be quick to criticize him, but the job that your office department has done, 1.9 million claims. Uh, the commissioner told me one time over 800,000 fraudulent claims that they have to look into every week. I mean, there's a lot of work, plus the fact they were staffed for a good economy. So, they, you know, the staffing for unemployment was not at a level when we were in a downturn. So uh, I know they've called in a lot of people, a lot of places. Um, the and, and I, I don't really have any issues with what they're, you're wanting to do with this bill. I, I, I understand what Representative Carpenter is saying. I've seen the same thing. Those We had people making $1,265 not working, and then we bring them back to work, and um, you know, they're making eight or nine hundred. That's that's not quite as extreme as what his numbers were, but it it affects them. But what we explained to them is that was based on unemployment or partial employment for COVID-19, or this would only be in an emergency. We would expect this to go back to the fifty dollars a week uh, when the emergency's over. Is that kind of way you see it? That that particular measure would be permanent. It would give the commissioner the authority to set that set the level. Um, mm -hmm. You know, up to three hundred dollars a week. But he wouldn't have to maintain it necessarily at three hundred. No, he wouldn't. No. Okay. I don't see any more questions at this point. Uh, Representative Sam Park. Thank you, Chairman. Sorry, I jumped in late there. Um, thank you for the presentation of the bill, and, and I would echo the comments of my colleagues. Um, greatly appreciate the good work the Georgia Department of Labor has done to help us with our constituents and the challenges they've had with their benefits. So um, I, I was reading through um, the letter from Legislative Council in regards to uh, retroactivity, and it seemed to be that it seemed to be Legislative Council's opinion. Uh, that because no benefits are being taken away, uh, that um, y there should be no um, uh, th there should be no issue. That said, if we're looking at Section Two, um, which would give the commissioner discretion to go lower than the fifty dollar deductible, would that be taking a benefit away? Right. I understand that the commissioner has the discretion uh, to set the uh, deductible earnings up to three hundred dollars, yep. but it also removes the floor. Yes, as it is written, it does remove the floor. So, from a from a legal constitutional perspective, in the event this gets challenged, I'm not, you know, that's that's a question beyond me. Um, what would that uh, cause issues with this bill moving forward? I may have to defer to Sean Marie. Sean Marie. <laughs> Don't be hiding behind that post. I know that it isn't the intent to go below the level that it currently is now, right. but you're, you're correct. That might raise an issue. I think you bring up an excellent point. Um, the way that I read this legislation, that when you get to line 125, which I believe you're referring to, is that the? Uh, no, I was actually looking at the section two of LC 3644.06S, uh, lines 20 to 24. Or 22 to 24, thank you, uh, where y'all struck out uh, existing code. And, and one thought or recommendation would be to maybe leave in the minimum of $50 um, and, and provide the discretion for up to $300. Um, so I don't read that particular code section as having a um, date restriction. It's not retroactive. That's going forward. I see. So Section 2 is actually... Um, it won't take effect until the legislation is passed. There okay. are provisions in the bill that are retroactive. For instance, if you look at on page two at line 56, 
that does it's going to capture things that happened two days mm -hmm. ago so it is a look back there and it's my understanding that those particular provisions that are um, tied to that look back date are granting benefits that aren't currently provided they're not taking anything away mm -hmm. that being said um, irrespective of that date if you wanted to make it so that the commissioner having nothing to do with retroactivity but just to a policy point can't go lower than what mm -hmm. an employee can already receive then I think you are correct that you would establish the floor from 30 to 300 does that answer your question yeah. It, it does, and I'd, I'd leave that up to my colleagues. So I had one more question, Chairman, if I may. Sure. So I, I, I saw in, in Section 4 that um, y'all bifurcate claims filed before Jan June 14th and after uh, June 14th um, as to claims being filed. Is there a difference in benefits received for those who filed before and afterwards um, based on uh, the, the formula that that's set? And could y'all explain perhaps why there is that bifurcation? The June 14th date, I think, initially was the expectation that the state of emergency might end at that time. So since it's been extended out, um, whenever that emergency ends, um, by operation of the existing law, um, there will be a reduction in the number of weeks that an individual would be eligible for if this bill um, you know, was not adopted. Um, as well as the deductible earnings level would that would be reduced back to what it was before. Okay, um, but but in terms of actual benefits received before and after uh, June fourteenth, um, I'm sorry. Could you could you explain yeah. one more time? Just kind of <laughs> yeah. As long yeah. as the state of emergency is still in effect, we we have authority to continue the levels that we are right now. Mm -hmm. um, but when that state of emergency ends there could be then a reversion whenever that date is um, the effective date here um, could be moved out you know to July as well it wouldn't matter again because we're not taking uh, anything away um, from we're actually adding to their benefits so um, yeah when when the state of emergency ends there could be a reduction if this bill doesn't uh, isn't adopted okay uh, given the given just the changing nature and all the uncertainty regarding the pandemic if the state of emergency gets extended beyond July 12th, um, if this bill does not move forward, those benefits would still continue yes, under would. the state of emergency. Yes. But if it does come to an end, we're saying that uh, those who fall after June 14th would receive less, fewer benefits. Is that yes, correct? Yes, fewer weeks. The, the amount could be lower to it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my concerns, I guess, are just a really much broader policy concerns that we, um, in some ways, um, are going to be overreactive based on the, the situation we're in right now, where we're going to um, start granting all sorts of authorities to, to folks based on an, an emergency that, that we may not need to grant and that we should be very careful when we um, grant these authorities to um, non-elected officials um, and departments that have such um, have such authority and, and have such a sway in um, in our uh, economy in our state so my concern is that that we are uh, rather than operating one way during normal uh, course of business and operating a different way in an emergency, why not look at a, a way to operate that accounts for times of emergency and not uh, grants um, these, these types of authorities to the, de the commissioner and the department? Um, and that's, that's not a mark against the, the commissioner. It's just a, for, for me, a broader policy issue of granting those kind of authorities um, in a situation where um, I, I'm, I know that there was a that the department itself was in some ways overwhelmed with what's going on but um, you know I don't know that we ought to enact such broad 
a broad scope of changes to grant these authorities to the department simply because we don't, you know, we don't think that we can operate otherwise. So that uh, not, again, not a mark against the department is just a, for me, a broader policy question of granting um, almost unlimited authority within a, a emergency situation to a non-elected official. So that's all I've got, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, let me take this mask off. I'm sorry, this drives me crazy. <laughs> all right, so quick question. Is there concern at all of changing that, uh, that unemployment rate from the six that was previously down to that 4.5? Is there a concern that, that at that point I mean, because really, unemployment at four point five is pretty full employment in my in my theories. I think once you get below five percent, it's you know you're kind of it's you're having a hard time finding employees. So uh, that would be a little bit of a concern for me. Uh, and then, of course, the other piece that I talked about earlier, and I was thinking in my mind, how do we come up with a scenario, and why can't we set that three hundred dollars? Why can't we set it as? Is there a way in your system to set it up as a percentage of previous income? So uh, let's say you're making a thousand dollars a week. Well, now you can make up to fifty percent of your prior income and still be eligible. It's some something besides that three hundred dollar piece. I don't know how if your system would allow that. If it would really complicate the computations that you have to do. But I think moving forward, that may be a remedy for that situation I was talking to you about. And that's one thing I love about this process. If you think about, well, all our committees were put on these committees because of our subject matter. And you got Casey, who's got a medium number of employees making a lot of them on the lower end. You've got Kirby at a very big business with some very big salary people. I'm kind of in between the two. Don't have as many employees, but they're paid a lot more than minimum. And then Todd, who runs a pretty good size uh, tech firm. So anyway, I'd, uh, especially when uh, people like Casey bring that kind of um, perspective, that's that's why we're here to to make some good policy changes. Uh, Mr. Kirby. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, a question for you, sir. I, I've got some some changes. They address a lot of what Representative Park brought up. I think they're in 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 good faith of what we're wanting to happen. I know the hour is late as we're getting closer and closer to when we're going to adjourn, but this is one, two, three, it's several places throughout the bill. I would therefore recommend we not take action today. Let's get with legislative council and get it a clean version and meet again before, we, even though we are, I know time is of the essence, um, but I'd rather, I mean, I can do it, we could do it verbally, but I think it would look, be a whole lot better with all the changes if we had a clean version to look at. Um, my only thought is, and I agree, we don't want to rush something for the sake of being rushed, but leadership is uh, why we met on two hours notice instead of the usual meeting time we had slotted for tomorrow. But I do want to get this right. So... Um, what if we put together not necessarily a committee what what if uh, I appointed Mr. Kirby, Mr. Carpenter, and Mr. Park to get together with some changes let's sleep to, let's meet tomorrow and get this out. Would that work with everybody because we we do want to get it right. And I, and I think that's a good mix of three very smart business guys who, who could who could help. And either uh, y'all could get individually with uh, Sean Marie or Christina Smith or or attorney. Um, would that be okay with everybody? Because I, I think y'all right. And again, that's that's what we're here for. We don't we to make good policy based on what's going to be best for everybody. Any other questions? All right. Both. 
You okay with that, Mr. Strickland and Department of Labor? As long as you don't take my part out of it, I'm good with it. <laughs> yeah, I, think we're, I think we're good with that. Thank you. All right, with that, we're going to stand adjourned and stay tuned for tomorrow, and I appreciate y'all's fluid uh, response.